So, let's go. <laughs> We're very happy to have Andrea Kolnitz here. She came, she had been here, uh, been a resident in our, uh, uh, we have some apartments for uh, researchers and uh, artists uh, that stays here for, for two or four weeks. And she had been here several times to work on this book that she will present. It's not edited yet, but uh, available yet, but anyway, uh, about Leonor Fini and her uh, self-auto performances and, and the costumes. And um, the reason why we want to present a work on Leonor Fini is multiple. It's one, because she lived in this building actually for 30 years uh, before Sweden bought it in 1965. Uh, she had already left, but she lived here, and there are several pictures. Maybe you will see some of these photos of Leonor in Hotel de Mar, in the from the 30s until the early 60s. And then the other reason, uh, so we're very curious to, to know more about her, and I can show you this, maybe. We made a jubilee book when we celebrate our 50th, Burst a birthday on uh, here at the Swedish Institute, and in this book, we made a, quite a nice article about Leonor Finish. Here she is in the Hotel de Marne, and we have se several pages about her. Uh, I thought it was uh, important. Uh, and the other reason why we do this, especially right now, is because of this exhibition you already seen at least a part of it. Uh, by Sara Eriksson, a young artist, uh, painter, and she, when she prepared her uh, exhibition here at Swedish Institute, she came to Paris for some days, and she looked at the uh, our art collection of old art, but she also was interested in the history of the place, and she learned about Leonor Fini and her um, life here uh, in Paris. So, uh, one of the pictures actually are a direct uh, inspiration from a photo of Leonor Fini with a uh, cat mask. So, that's the other reason, because we wanted to create a, like a program around this uh, Sara Ville Eriksson exhibition. So, that's the reasons. <laughs> now to the participants. Uh, so, Andrea Kolnitz, you were born in Austria? but you work in Sweden, I live in Sweden for several, uh, since several years. You're an art uh, professor, uh, associated professor in art history and head of the art history department at the University of Stockholm. You also work as a senior lecturer at the Center for Fashion Studies Stockholm, at Stockholm University. Your research are focused on uh, themes as art and nationalism, avant-garde art in the Nordic countries, artist self-fashioning, and connections between fashion and art during, during modernism. Uh, you're also a co-editor of the book Fashion and Modernism, edited by Bloomsbury in 2018, and Fashion Performance and Performativity, also at Bloom, uh, Bloomsbury, edited in 2022, amongst other books. And after publishing, publishing several articles on Leonor Fini, you are currently working on a monography about this artist entitled Becoming Leonor Fini, Theatrical Self-Performances Between Art and Life. And that will also be edited at, by Bloomsbury. And then uh, after this lecture, uh, short lecture, uh, Andrea will uh, discuss with Sasha Llewellyn, who's over there. <laughs> Um, you're a British art historian, a curator and author living in Paris since 2020. You have been studying and writing about and curating exhibition of women artists for 30 years, especially women surrealist artists. In 2017, you co-curated co an exhibition at the Dulwich Picture Gallery in London on this theme. And in 2023, you contributed to the exhibition Surrealism of Femin Surrealism of Femina, I go to French, uh, at the Musée de Montmartre à Paris. In 2022, you created RAW, Rediscovering Art by Women, a non-profit uh, non 
association that combines a collection of work by women surrealists with sponsorship of research and uh, with sponsorship of research and supporting women artists working today. So I hope you will get a nice evening. And uh, at the end of the, the talk, you will be able to, to uh, ask questions to, to participate. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. Is it on my microphone? Yes. Yes. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me here as well. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I really love this house and the whole aura of it, and uh, especially also because, of course, Leonor Fini lived here for more than 20 years. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to present to you uh, what, which is based on my research on Leonor Fini, which has been going on for about eight years, actually. I've been coming to Paris again and again in smaller and bigger episodes to just explore her personal archive which is at Rue de la Vrière, uh, her, her second long-time apartment in Paris. Um, and, um, okay, sorry. And uh, I am also, I, I would have loved to speak in French, uh, but my French isn't that good yet, so I hope you will uh, bear with me in English, and I will try not to read too quickly. Um, so again, what I'm going to tell you now is based on my upcoming book on Leonor Fini, Becoming Leonor Fini, Theatrical Self-Performance Between Art and Life. Leonor Fini was born in Buenos Aires to Italian parents, growing up in Trieste, Italy, and moving to Paris in her early 20s, where she chose to spend the rest of her life mainly. Fini, she was a self-taught painter who early on gained an international reputation as a skilled, multifaceted artist, working in a style reminiscent of mannerism as well as close to surrealism and magic realism. While known and appreciated for her abundant, manifold creative production and advanced painterly technique, as well as her costume designs for the theater, for the opera, for films, for example, with Visconti and Fellini. Fini was equally famous and admired for her numerous costumed, theatrically styled and spectacular public appearances. And in my book, I explore Leonor Fini's self-fashioning and dressing up practices as a crucial part of her art production. I have visited the Leonor Fini archives in Paris during the past eight years, which was a fascinating journey. Now, finally ending up in this book about her spectacular ways to perform herself as an artist, as a woman, and as a constantly changing being of extraordinary liberty in her time. In my book, I investigate how Fini expands creation of two-dimensional artworks into her self-creation through costumes, masks, and fashion. Her self-performances have been portrayed in meticulously staged photographs by some of the 20th century's most prominent photographers, which make the main material in my book. As she wrote, uh, herself in a book about herself, Le Livre de Leonor Fini. When I was a child, I hated to be photographed. I ran away. By and by, I became more interested in having a face, a confirmation of my existence. From mirrors, I went on to photographs. Since then, I've always been photographed, in costume, disguised, in daily life. But I don't like snapshots. Nothing is more false than trying to capture the natural. The pose is revealing, and I'm curious and amused to see my multiplicity, which I'm well aware of, confirmed by those images. People tell me, you should have been an actress. No, I'm only interested in the inevitable theatricality of life. 
Leonor Fini was apparently one of the most photographed women during the 20th century. And here I will show you just quickly examples from her childhood to evolving into this extremely spectacular and self-confident, self-fashioned artist and woman. And you can literally follow how the camera, how the gaze of the camera and all of these different photographers helped her to, in a way, invent herself. So we start with this ch shy child. Um, the young woman who is, of course, like <coughs> quite ordinary and not very uh, stylish, but like everyone. Uh, here you can see that she's already trying out a kind of pose, but she's still a little awkward and not very accomplished as in her self-performance. But then she starts to, to bloom with certain photographers like Veno Pilon, Henri Cartier-Bresson, who also was her friend, Man Ray, George Platt Lines, in this very um, sculptural presentation, which also resembles her sphinxes, actually, which become very important for her paintings and self-identification. And here, a very important collaboration with Dora Maar, which is actually photographed in this building, in the apartment where Leonor Fini lived. Uh, here too, um, and this is one of the most famous and iconic photographs of Leonor Fini in her apartment at Rue Payenne, uh, with her very important avatar animal, the cat. And you can see this combination of a very erotically enticing and seductive woman, but with a very strong gaze, with, with a powerful uh, posture and a powerful gaze that is not subordinate in any way. Uh, many fashion photographers photographed Fini like Erwin Blumenfeld here. Lee Miller did this quite natural and beautiful photograph in the Provence in 1939. The fashion photographer Horst P. Horst uh, searched after Fini and wanted to photograph her. Also, this is done in the studio here at Rue Payenne. So you can see what, what happens with her and how photographs really evolve her as a person and as a woman and as an artist. And in the first part of my book, I look at Leonor Fini's theatrical self-performances uh, at the 24 costume balls she attended from, 19, from 1939 to the early 70s. As she said, she believed in the inevitable theatricality of life. Um, and, she, as she, and made herself and her body to an expansion of her artworks. Merging life and art into one big drama, Fini con continuously transformed herself and, sorry, that too many things to hold, <laughs> and uh, transgressed fixed roles in fantastic, artistically advanced costumes often made by great fashion designers who also were Fini's friends, such as Elsa Schiaparelli, which you can see here, Dior and Simonetta. The balls provided the perfect stage for that. And these aristocratic balls also gave her the occasion to stand out and perform herself as extraordinary and spectacular. As she describes her experience here, I have always loved and lived my own theatre. To dress up, to cross-dress, is an act of creativity. The opportunity of dressing up was the only reason why I went to costume balls at the time when they were at their peak just after the war. The real excitement for me was preparing my costume. I used to arrive late, about midnight, lightheaded with joy at being a royal owl, a large grey lion, the queen of the underworld. I only looked in mirrors, there were always plenty, fortunately, in those large houses, and after an hour or two, having gazed long enough at my reflection, I would say to my friends, enough, let's go. <laughs> in the archives, I was actually allowed to try on some of Fini's gowns and could feel their amazing qualities on my own body. Here, for example, is a costume that also was uh, exhibited at the Venice Biennale last year. So uh, the physical essential qualities of the garments are as important to Fini as actually what they mean, what they could mean. Um, 
and Feeney strived for a powerful performance, both in her paintings and self-presentation. She performed herself as equal, if not superior, to celebrated male artists. Thus, in part two of my book, The Art of Self-Fashioning, I focus on Feeney's self-fashioning in painted self-portraits and in photographs. And as I claim, following the ideals of Italian mannerism, that strongly influenced her paintings, Feeney shaped herself and her artist's role as an artwork to be created and recreated on daily basis. This was the mannerist's idea of being an artist. An artist should live like they paint and even paint their bodies, dress their bodies like they paint. So she followed this, as I claim. And here we can see uh, that already as a young artist, she equals herself to the master Jan van Eyck and his first true, uh, the first self-portrait in Western art history, actually. Um, and she was especially inspired by Italian mannerists, such as Bronzino and Tizian, which you can see here. She poses just like them and she dresses similarly. Uh, and she has the gaze of a self-confident, autonomous, male Renaissance artist. Um, so, uh, Leonor Fini um, equaled herself to men, but all in all, also, she hated and refused all kinds of categories and labels. And she loved to transgress all kinds of rules and create also, especially, undefinable hybrid identities through dressing up. And that is the theme of the third part in my book, where I speak about her urge for transgression through dressing up. Um, Becoming Other is the title, and I look both at Feeney's personal performances, but also at her interactions with her many friends. For example, her surrealist friend, Leonora Carrington, which you can see here, this photo is taken at Le Payen, and even this photo is taken in the, in the rooms where now, I think, the offices of the Swedish Institute are placed. Uh, I look at Finis and other women surrealists dressed up self-performances as a creative tool of artistic and personal empowerment and autonomy. These individual as well as collective dressing up practices must be seen as an organic part and expansion of surrealist ideals on the symbiosis of life and art. Countless pictures in Finney's photographic archive capture her costume feasts with artists and designer friends. For example, here in Nonza, Corsica, where she spent her summers in the 50s and 60s. Feeney started to dress up early in her life. Tellingly, she never felt like a mother to her dolls, for example, but instead she dressed them up like actresses or models. A fascination for clothes, costumes, masks, accessories, fabrics, from contemporary fashion to historical garments, inspired by especially Renaissance, Baroque, and Belle Epoque fashions, from animal furs and feathers to luxury adornments, figure throughout Feeney's entire life and art production. She meticulously designed her own spectacular costumes, which were then realized by skillful craftswomen or prominent fashion designers, such as Elsa Schiaparelli, Christian Dior, or Simonetta. Later, these were reenacted on meticulously styled photographs, for example, here by André Ostier, who photographed her many times throughout her life. A kind of self-portrait uh, in collaboration with skillful artist photographers, many of whom became iconic. But there are also large numbers of casually taken photographs that demonstrate Finney's love for dressing up. In this casually taken photograph, Feeney looks like a semi-nude feminine model in summer fashions. However, this impression is disrupted, not only by the antique draping of her towel, but most of all by a startling headdress which is made from onions. This wig of onions, which was obviously taken from Feeney's garden, appears strange, funny, and startling, startlingly out of place, 
At the same time, it comes forward as beautiful with attractive central qualities, such as shiny, bright, pearl-like surfaces and shapes rolling down her chest. In surrealist terms, we could call this a spontaneously found costume or costume trouvé. Found costumes are also staged in photographs of Carrington and Ernst, Max Ernst in Saint Martin d'Ardèche, where they are wearing vegetables, playfully and beautifully, but also alluding to mythological creatures. While the blending and assemblage of unrelated objects in hybrid costumes <coughs> recalls the surrealist fascination for chance meetings, Feeney was also strongly engaged in the sensual and visual beauty of these objects. Marvelous effects come from Feeney's headdress for the sorceress she embodied at the Bal de Panache in 1947. Meticulously designed, crafted, and oftentimes inspired by characters in her paintings, Feeney's costumes materialize her self-visions. They transfer them from visual two-dimensional to material three-dimensional shapes. As Feeney has claimed, most of the women she paints are her. This means she imagines herself first on her canvas, but then obviously wants to transpose this painted figure to her own body. The sorceress Feeney staged at the Val de Panache was shortly before imagined in her painting Struge à from the same year. A powerful female creature recurring as a figure of inspiration throughout her entire life and art production, this sorceress she presents. Her marvelous headdress displays uncanny attributes that speak of surrealist influences, as well as of Fini's identification with Renaissance art and witchcraft. A crude animal cranium is put into striking contrast with materials of luxury, such as tulle, rhinestone, pearls, shining silks, and so on. Typical for Fini, uh, items referring to nature, primitivism and an animal uh, character, an animalistic term from modern civilization are boldly combined with signs of modern fashionable glamour. Found costumes can also lead in to what the surrealists call displacement, not only of objects but of bodies and identities and the combination of natural and unnatural, beautiful and macabre elements in Feeney's compositions corresponds with the surrealist desire for transgressions. Surrealist dressing up uh, practices keep animating beautiful objects from nature. Already the collaborative dressing up games uh, in Saint-Martin d'Adèche of Max Ernst and Lu Leonora Carrington in the 1939 shows such applications. But it was from the 1950s onward when Feeney most actively indulged in such games at her medieval ruin summer residences at Torre San Lorenzo outside of Rome or in the monastery ruins on the cliffs of Corsica. Practices that were strikingly portrayed by the Italian photographer Eddie Brofierio, who we can see here. Uh, we can look at Fini at San Lorenzo, displayed with flower bushes, covering and embracing her whole body. And uh, she's literally becoming a bush here. She's not only decorating herself, she's like really wanting to become a plant in a way. Um, and we can also look at her artist friends that are shown dressed in bushes. For example, you can see the sublime depiction of Dorothea Tanning to the left, visiting Fini on Corsica in the 1960s, with her head adorned by a large brown bush with dry twigs and leaves. The bush's shape seems to echo the shape of a quattrocento headdress in Pisanello's portraits of aristocratic ladies that also inspired other headdresses designed by Fini for herself at the theater. 
Feelies, tree and flower women meant to enable transgression between genders and species, referring to hermetic, mythical and supernatural women like sorceresses, priestesses or goddesses, they offer empowering hybridity, echoing other surrealist games and practices such as the collective drawing of cadaver exqui, Feeney's playful displacements uh, in her costumes shift, dissolve and liberate her identity. One recurring object in Feeney's identity shifts are wigs recalling feline manes or male baroque periwigs of very different kinds, which she experiments with throughout her entire life. Made in all kinds of materials, ranging from feathers and furs to wool or paper, they appear <coughs> on her and others' heads, as well as in her paintings and drawings. Most iconic is Feeney's wig of black feathers, an object first imagined and made in the late 1930s that was used on many heads. From Feeney's painted sphinxes, like you see here, to her own head in different kinds of photographs portraying her as an artist, but also to the heads of her male sitters, as for example in the portrait of the Italian Count Borromeo. It opens up creative liberties, aesthetic pleasure, and experiences of the marvelous. Much more than an accessory or adornment, it becomes an object of transformation, like a magic disguise, changing and empowering its wearer. The feather wig evokes birds and animals, sexually empowering manes of hair on erotically seductive women, baroque periwigs for men of status, it provides beautiful adornment for androgynous young men and lion manes on powerful sphinxes. Feather wigs created by Feeney are also performed when the two Leonors exhibit together in 1952, making the press describe them in terms of witches. One of the wigs' most iconic applications lies in the figure of a black angel that Feeney staged in September 1951 at the famous Bal de Masque Domino, uh, also called Ball of the Century, Bal du Siècle, at Palazzo Labia in Venice. In a crowd of luxuriously dressed celebrities, Fini stood out as a monochrome black angel. Her angel persona symbolized a spiritual, divine, and androgynous opposite, superior to the profane wealth of the mundane human crowd of kings and queens. This distinctive performance of the angel of death, as the press called it, illustrates the proud ecstasy and flamboyant isolation Feeney says she felt when dressed up. A photographic portrait taken a bit later by the Italian photographer Vittorio Pavan again sheds light on Feeney's fusion between the painting of figures on the canvas and the painting or self-creation of her own body in costume. The black feather wig here resembles a heavy allonge wig worn by Baroque men of fashion and status. The masculine features of the wig fit in with Feeney's gaze, a thoughtful gaze, that evokes the superiority and independence in male portraits throughout the centuries. As mysterious as the painter appears the artwork, which is recognizable as one of Feeney's most prominent paintings, L'Ange de l'Anatomie. As often before, Feeney here doubles her face through the combination of her real face with her painted one. Her shiny, heavy, and Voluminous black wig is in contrast with the white, seemingly lightweight and dried up periwig on the skeleton angel. The figure of the angel of death, or ange de l'anatomie, further merges male and female identity into one joint identity. As Feeney has said about this painting, my painting is male and female, man and woman in one, wanting a state of the ideal as an angel. How do we reach this ideal state? That would be wonderful to know. 
So her, her idea was that men and women should be one. Putting on the costume and making herself an ideal and androgynous black angel was perhaps one way for Feeney to reach the ideal state imagined in her painting. But most central in her life and art uh, is Feeney's identification with and dressing up as animals. Her main avatar was the cat, whose independence, intelligence and beauty she equally adored. Her lifelong affinity with feline animals is not only evoked in her painted sphinxes, which are lion women, uh, her novels, for example, Mourmour, Conte pour les enfants velus, uh, and texts. It is evoked in her feline masks and costumes, the shaping and styling of her own gaze and face into a more and more cat-like appearance not to speak of the many cats she lived with as her family. Yet all kinds of animals, not least owls and other birds for her, held the potentials of beautiful appearance combined with power and strength. As she says, to dress up gives me the feeling of another dimension, another species and space. One can feel like a giant, dive into the underworld, become an animal, until one feels invulnerable and timeless, a part of forgotten rituals. Dressing up and becoming animal enables transformation into basically anybody, anything. Entering unlimited spaces and dimensions, Feeney experienced strength and freedom from any kind of exterior influence. The empowering qualities in animal attributes Feeney describes like this. I have always thought that the human attributes are quite reduced, quite limited. I have envied beasts, their hard claws, their resounding hooves, their sparkling phosphorescent shells, their thick coats, especially their horns, horns which allow such pretty movements of the head. They give strange... <clears throat> allure, dignity, exaltation, aggressiveness if necessary. So becoming animal for Feeney meant <coughs> both beauty, powerful protection, and the possibility to turn aggressive, even terrifying. While Feeney loved to perform on her own, theatrical performances, masquerades and happenings are an important part of the collective practices in Dada and Surrealism. They were meant to affect the actors as well as their audiences and inspire them to transformation and transgression. In their masquerade games and creative collaborations, Feeney and her friends imagined and staged scenarios uh, with self-created costumes where anybody could become anything. Such games, for example, in Saint Martin d'Ardèche at Ernst and Carrington's house, experimented with what the Surrealists called a displacement of identities. They gave pleasure, fun and feelings of liberation, but also led to collaboratively creating aesthetic and artistic innovations. Here, for example, they have taken some undefinable fiber, I don't know what exactly that is, and play with it in all kinds of different versions. Um, and uh, we can especially look at Edi Bruferio's images from the Franciscan monastery of Monza, Corsica, in the 1960s. Here, Fini spent her summers from 1954 to the mid-60s and indulged in dressing up together with her artist, designer, and celebrity friends, also from the film and fashion world. She surrounded herself with creative, beautiful people. One of these displays Fini, her partner Stanislao Lepli, and the fashion model Edita Dusler in costumes and poses of cross-dressing, referring to Renaissance or late medieval figures. Costumes here seem to be spontaneously created from what was available and found in nature or in the house. A high hat with a long veil on his head, Lepli poses a foot-long striped gown in black and white, adorned by two round white shells, demarcating female breasts. 
Her face without makeup, Dussler is dressed like a male page with tight modern trousers. Her long hair is hidden by a large straw basket torn apart at its fringe, which makes for a conic shape recalling the headdress of Egyptian pharaohs or African tribal costumes. The strange and undefinable objects created in Finis and her friends' disguises that freely change their identities I see as a kind of queer objects, objects that liberate and create queer and open identities. The collective performances on beaches, in the landscape around Nonsa, in the monastery ruins, seem to live out what Fini expresses in her visual autobiography, Le Livre de Lionel Fini. Here she writes, To put on a costume, to dress up, is an act of creativity. It means inventing oneself, changing, making apparent the mutability and multiplicity which one can feel inside. It is one of several representations of oneself. It is a creative expression in the raw. The act of dressing up is multiple narcissism as you enter other images and still become your own show. But even more fascinating, because while entering a sort of trance, you still know that you are yourself underneath. These states also provoke a flamboyant isolation, but at the same time a state of non-life, because you sometimes feel that you forget the world that surrounds you. It is a proud ecstasy, which some might call negative and repellent. These words of Fini show that dressing up is not only about self-experience, but also about the effect on others. Here is another very telling quote. With costumes and masks, I feel I become an extension of myself. I really enjoy it, and that is why I used to go to the balls. Sometimes my costumes were so extravagant that people stood aside to let me pass. I rather appreciated that. No one else really knew how to dress up. I think I had quite an influence on the rich crowd associated with those balls. But I never wanted to dance with anyone. That seemed stupid. When anyone asked me to dance, I would think, poor fool. <laughs> so, wanting to take her own space, Fini keeps others, like the poor fool at the ball, at a distance, through the voluntary isolation and proud ecstasy <laughs> of a femme extraordinaire, a sovereign presence, who, like a powerful queen, makes people step back in awe. And of course, would she have been dancing, she would have become a normal person uh, that doesn't control her movements, that gets out of the image she's uh, pr presenting in this very perfect way. Um, the creatures Fini chose to paint and stage are often close to mythical, occult, and supernatural women characters. But as I argue, her passion for becoming others through costumes is also about, uh, it's more about, uh, more than, it's about more than the symbolic meaning of these powerful women. It also literally strengthens her on a physical and sensual level. The material costume, the feathers she wears, for example, make her feel like an animal or a superwoman while they also create overwhelmed emotional reactions from the audiences who witnessed her spectacular uh, performances. She wanted them to experience her as a powerful visual and spectacular phenomenon of immediately dazzling and even terrifying impact. Yes, there are several examples how she wanted to terrify people and dominate. Uh, as she herself said, People say that I have the need to dominate, but that's not true. I just do it. <laughs> um, and uh, as an epitomic of this dominant woman ruler, which she becomes more and more the older she gets, she, she turns from being seductive to being impressive and intimidating. Um, uh, we can look at this uh, uh, figuration here with her compelling gaze 
and immutable strength, and this, it's a kind of sorceress and goddess-like figure that Feeney stages on the cliffs of Corsica in 1965. An abundant animalist headdress in the shape of large shining black feathers adorned with jewelry frames a dramatically painted face. Her feline eyes have taken on this firm, intimidating gaze, forcing her subjects on their knees. They are effectively combined with her pointing finger and its sharpened nail, a gesture of prophetic force. And her body is dressed in a white, heavy, shimmering gown, enveloping her whole body and shown in different shapes, spread out like the wings of a large bird along the rough coastal edge. She presents herself like a divine force, and I've actually been wearing this gown myself and it's very heavy so you really move in a certain way when you have that on you and you do things with your arms that are uh, change you in a way a little bit in the moment uh, and uh, for the final conclusion then in this uh, talk uh, transgressive and liberated as well as controlling and dominating in her practices of dressing up, Feeney makes herself autonomous. She creates herself as an object of beauty and simultaneously becomes a forever powerful subject. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you so much, Andrea, for such a fascinating talk and so many wonderful images. Mm. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here tonight as well in this magical building, which was where Leonor Finney lived, but also Bona de Mondiag, another uh, important woman surrealist that's perhaps less famous than, than Leonor Finney. Um, I'm really excited about your book <laughs> um, and to read more. And, um, you were talking about working on the Leonore Finney archives in Paris yes. um, and I was wondering two questions really how extensive are those archives and what is in them and um, also you showed so many pictures where Leonore Finney is choreographing her own image and you talked about um, her own autobiography that she wrote uh, the lead to Leonore Finney um, and also the fact that she retains her archives. In what way did she choreograph um, her own legacy? In what way did she choreograph the way that she would be remembered after she had died through retaining these archives and through her own book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, the Leonor Fini archives uh, were at the Rue de la Villière, where uh, Fini lived uh, during the last, uh, like, 20, almost 30 years of her life. Uh, which, like here at Rue Payenne, was a combined uh, apartment and studio, and now an archive. However, the archive has partially been moved now to Yale University, because that was the wish of Leonor Fini, and the archive director is, is becoming older and wanted to get things uh, into control, uh, but a large part is still there, and uh, the archive which I experienced, it contained uh, enormous amounts of photographs and photographic albums, uh, her writings, uh, press clippings, um, letters, uh, all of her books. Leonor Fini was extremely well read, very well educated. She had read lots of philosophy, psychology, uh, novels, um, stories from Renaissance to modern. She, she was extremely uh, intellectual, actually, and many people also ex appreciated her intellectual, uh, conversational talents. So, um, that's one aspect, and of course there were also drawings and paintings. Her bedroom is, in a way, unchanged, with lots of photographs on the walls and, and other pictures she loved, especially most of the photographs are of cats, <laughs> uh, and then a few of her men. <laughs> so, um, 
But uh, asking about, and then also costumes, or at least garments and fabrics that she used in her later years, because the earlier costumes uh, we saw for the balls, uh, nobody really knows where they are. They may have been uh, destroyed, or they are, uh, some of them maybe are in the US, in the, the Metropolitan Museum, uh, Costume Institute, and so on, but it's a bit unclear, it's not has not been traced properly. And my book is mainly about the photographic images. But regarding the legacy, um, it's interesting. Uh, I've, I've built a very close relationship to the archive director through these years, so he has told me lots of interesting stories about Leonor Fini. And it's actually him who, who organized this archive after her death, because she was very she was extremely efficient in her art production and very, very well organized, but she didn't care about uh, organizing any archive. She actually really didn't care. It was a, just chaos, I think, according to him. So he is the one who put everything into folders and organized and created this, uh, this legacy, actually. Uh, and also, um, yeah. Uh, a lot of things have happened since her death, actually, through mainly his work, I would say, yes. Um, it's so interesting because it's a fact that women's archives um, are less likely to be retained than men's archives, and it's, it's wonderful to hear that these have been so treasured. Um, obviously, Leonor Finney is um, ascending in popularity now, her pictures regularly um, fetch, I think, up to 1.5 million at auction. Um, was there a period after her death where she was languishing in obscurity or she was less well known, or has she always been a figure that has been um, appreciated in terms of, of a woman artist? Uh, that's a very interesting question and very hard to answer in a way because uh, Leonor Fini was kind of forgotten for a while. When I found her, so to say, I had never heard the name. I didn't know about all of these images. I didn't know anything about Leonor Fini. Uh, and uh, then I started to look more into it. And during the period I have worked on her, she has grown in, in fame and reputation again. She was very well known and very admired during her lifetime, at least uh, until the 1950s and 60s, I would say, um, she was very much admired by the surrealist uh, circle she was partially participating in, uh, and even other modern artists, uh, many like Picasso, Dali, male, male uh, macho artists, <laughs> I would say, said that Fini is, is, a, is, a, is, an, is one of the women artists that you should take seriously. So. So she was actually uh, known and uh, admired, and she got a lot of uh, reviews that really admired her way of painting, and, uh, but also always speaking about her appearance, about her charisma, about her extraordinary personality. So I think she, and she was also very well known, especially in Paris. She was an icon, she was visible. People who saw her on the streets or met her at restaurants knew who she was, so she was a celebrity. But uh, one of my thoughts is that that might have been a, a disadvantage for her. <laughs> An artist who is too visible, too beautiful, too uh, fashionable, and so on, um, takes the risk of not being taken seriously as an artist. So I believe that somehow all of these self-performances also got in the way of, of people just looking at her paintings and drawings. And, and uh, another aspect is that, uh, different from any other artist, she refused to modernize herself. She, she kept painting figuratively, <laughs> while others went into abstraction and adapted to the art movements, but she she remained, she, she believed in the figurative and she wanted to stay there and I think that was also a disadvantage for her. 
And then today she is found again, I think uh, both because surrealist women artists are on vogue, <laughs> they, are, they are unusually transgressive for their time, and surrealism as such, I think, is very, um, fits very well into our time. But also, she's like a predecessor to people like Lady Gaga, uh, David Bowie, uh, performers who actually are famous for their constant transformation. Uh, and she did that in the 30s. So what, what made me um, so interested in her case was that when I first spoke about her at an exhibition about herself, fashioning and dressing up, there were so many women, young women, who reacted like feeling very, very empowered after having seen her images. And it's the same still. So I think she has something very important to say. She is really, in a way, autonomous and uh, in a way that is very, very unusual and was very unusual for her time. Yes, I, I mean, she seems so groundbreaking in so many ways. Yeah. I was so thrilled to discover the images that you showed of, of her um, transposing herself or, or reimagining herself as an old master um, portrait um, by a man of a man, self-portraits. And in some ways that really foresees the um, huge surge of, of feminist artists in America, particularly I'm thinking of Mary Beth Edelson or Judy Chicago in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, uh, Mary Beth Edelson's um, picture of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper where she superimposes the faces of women artists. Mm -hmm. But these are, these are being done 20 years before that. So mm -hmm. she does seem groundbreaking in just so many ways. Um, but going back to this whole idea of labels, um, she clearly hated labels and um, she never called herself a surrealist, even though she clearly had affinities with surrealism. And I'm wondering as well, um, art history just loves labels. <laughs> Everything's a label in art history. And, and how, how can we break through those categorizations, those labels to, to, fight, to, to, to situate Leonor Finney in the place that she deserves. I mean, how how do you how do you feel that we can categorize her easily, or it, or does she defy categorization? Yeah, well, I um, which what I'm also doing in my book in a way. I I want to follow her lead, so I do not want to label her. I think I think it's fine. She's included into surrealism and surrealist women artists. But uh, I do not think it's the only way. Uh, it's also, uh, she, she didn't want to be called a surrealist. She didn't want to be called anything in a way. She did, thousand, she did a thousand things. As she says in the quote, she, she wants to explore her multiplicity. And uh, that means, uh, I once asked Richard Overstreet of the archive, well, is she like Cindy Sherman, who kind of, uh, place with stereotypes and he said no because Leonor Fini was the people she performed. She, she felt like this is me, this is me, this is me, this is me. She didn't play with roles, she was these. She wanted to be a cat, not just play a cat and so on. So that makes her unique and uh, also these, all of these photographs, they were never uh, exhibited in an exhibition it wasn't meant to be a performance for, in an art market, uh, but actually it was for herself, for her own strengthening, in a way. Uh, and I think uh, you don't need to label her, and I think today she, she may be labeled as a, as a very unique uh, woman artist uh, through um, just uh, choosing her own life in a way that's that's a, a model to follow she she also never wanted to call herself a feminist because she didn't like categories so she wasn't interested in being categorized and uh, but i i would say it's part of her having been forgotten that she didn't have a clear category to put her in <laughs> so i mean i find it fascinating that she never wanted to, I, I, I was reading Whitney, Chadney, um, Whitney Chadwick's book um, 
and what she said about Leonor Finney and she works with Leonor Finney on the sections in the book and Leonor Finney was very upset in many ways of being included in a book about about women artists and there was a wonderful quote where she said um, men have tried to exile to imprison women a study exclusively devoted to women is still a sort of exile um, and and also the way that she lived her life she was she was never married she wasn't a mother she wasn't a mon in monogamous relationships and a way to find this whole idea of what's what society is defined of as a woman so can, can we call her a woman artist? Can we put her into exhibitions of women artists in terms of how she thinks herself? Or, or do you think we just have to, to move beyond that? Well, I think she had nothing against being exhibited. <laughs> so, so wherever they put her, she would have been part of it. And uh, so it wasn't that, she wasn't that absolute right. to say no to she was, after all, agreeing to be in uh, Whitney Chadwick's book. Merit Oppenheim, for example, refused yeah. to be part of it. Yeah. But uh, it's also interesting because when I... Uh, she has the book she got by Whitney Chadwick in the archive. Leonor Feeney's version is in the archive and she has made lots of underlinings and question marks and even like uh, exclamation marks where she says, this is wrong. <laughs> wrong and so it's so these are wonderful materials to find in the archive actually where you can see her reactions to these art historians that have been trying to identify what she does but she had nothing against attention so yeah so, so, so in a way was this penchant this love she had of dressing up in so many different disguises we've seen cats and mythological figures and and um, old master paintings, etc. In a way, was that, but, but by dressing up as so many different personas, was that in, her, in a way her way of, of, um, of avoiding categorization? Yes, I guess. And, but also curiosity, as she says. She's curious about what happens if you dress up like this or that. What happens with you? Uh, and, uh, the, uh, yeah. Mm. Um, also, the, 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 I, I find it so interesting in a way her links with surrealism because she's the absolute epitome of the femme en forme, the, the maybe a little bit femme fatale, but in her own terms. Um, a, a lot of her work, um, a lot of her work, and the way that she dresses up, um, very much calls on on the female experience of the erotic, as opposed to how male surrealists eroticized women. Um, how groundbreaking do you think? Um, I, I mean, I, 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 I think I read that, that she even illustrated Juliet by Marquise de Sade. Yes. But, but how groundbreaking was her approach to um, women's own experience of the erotic? Um, well, she was very, int very much interested in, in sexuality and erotic. Uh, practices, um, so she was kind of liberated herself in her own practices and she paints a lot of naked women but she also has these very interesting uh, reversals where she puts a dressed woman uh, sitting on a naked man for example or sphinxes and feminine uh, creatures uh, watching or guarding or also like threatening, lying, sleeping, naked, androgynous male bodies. So um, she was very much interested in the body, the nude body, the naked body. Uh, and she was obviously, she was the first woman artist who illustrated Marquis de Sade's uh, novels. So, um, and, and interested also in the combination of sex and death and <clears throat> so I don't know how groundbreaking she was, but she was she was very progressive, I would say, um, in terms of that too. And, um, and, and, and what was the kind of reception of her erotic images? Because I, I read that in her obituary by George Melly, he, he described her as the the Sars of Vogue magazine, um, which is quite disparaging, but were, were, I mean, did the male surrealists feel threatened by her, by her, her 
um, turning over of, of their kind of image of the erotic woman into her own sexuality or own female sexuality? Uh, no, I think they admired her. Um, Breton admired what she did, although she hated, she didn't like him. <laughs> uh, Dali admired what she did, and they were even friends, uh, but she didn't agree with his view on women in general. So, so they were. Um, they admired her, and she was one of the very few women who were included in the first Grand Surrealism exhibition in New York in 1936. So she was she was someone to she was she was respected and admired among the male surrealists. Yes. Another thing I was really interested in is that in a way her dressing up and all these wonderful clothes and everything else is very ephemeral, and yet by asking or by being invited to be photographed wearing these costumes or having herself photographed in a way she turns something ephemeral into something permanent so in what ways in some ways was she when she was dressing up was she imagining that these that the, that her in her fancy dress clothes were an artwork or did she think of them more as a, as passing through through time as passing through time yeah. there is a very nice story where um, this one of these coats looking like that one were stolen by a, she thinks of a, a shepherd a Corsica and she writes about that in her book and she she writes that she loves the <coughs> idea that this shepherd will sleep on this coat and it will be like a magic coat to him <laughs> that protects him so she was not at all possessive about these things. They, they could, uh, also another, um, Richard Overstreet told me that she gave away some of her costumes to, to uh, an American uh, housemaid, uh, which he knew from his, he was his American. She gave it away to, to kind of a black uh, housemaid who used it in her um, religious, meetings to to kind of dance and roll around on the floor and and she loved the idea that that would happen to her costume so so she she really loved like the wig we saw the black wig moving around giving it to anybody and, and have seeing what happens when you when when you put on this or you do it or it's so no uh, and that's maybe also why we do not really know where her costumes are um, do, you, do you think they've been destroyed or do you think they, I mean, do they sometimes turn up at auction? Do they sometimes emerge or have they just disappeared for a, uh, since she's died? Um, this one exists, <laughs> this whole uh, outfit exists uh, and others uh, from her later life exist. But the earlier ones, the fantastic feather costumes and so on, I do not know. I, I will maybe, when this is finished, go on looking for the costumes. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder how you felt about seeing her costume at the Venice Biennale and the Milk of Dreams exhibition, because in a way displaying a costume in that exhibition was making it into a work of art, because it was primarily, mm. uh, it was primarily a sculpture and painting exhibition. Did you feel that it was wrong that they should display one of the costumes as an artwork? Or no. no. I think they are. I mean, that's what I'm claiming anyway. I'm not saying the objects are artworks, but I'm saying they are part of her art production. So, no, it's not wrong to exhibit them at all. No. I think it's fascinating to put them together with the. I, I'm also fascinated by how many surrealist women artists identified with the kind of hybrid animal female figure, mm -hmm. also so many mythological figures, um, and especially with Leonor Finney, the, the, the Sphinx. Um, are, in a way, do you think it, ex it expresses a dissatisfaction with, with the women in their own contemporary worlds, in a way animals are closer to nature, uh, um, have more power, there's less uh, gendering of, of animals in the animal kingdom, or did she have different motivations for identifying so often with, with animals? Well, I've, I've done a comparison with Leonora Carrington. Leonora Carrington identified with horses very strongly, and in her stories, there are both in her paintings and her stories, there are lots of transformations from human to animal, 
and both of them also dressed up together, for example, as horses and uh, in other ways with these feather wigs you saw. Uh, I think animal was, was, uh, um, was an analogy for freedom, freedom and strength and, and a kind of also uh, uh, maybe kindness, uh, something that is uh, superior to human human uh, conflicts and uh, human uh, power relations and so on. So animals are idealized as a kind of ideal. The life with the cats, for example, it was like an ideal life with this. There, there is this painting I showed at the beginning. Um, uh, which recently, unfortunately, has been destroyed. But this painting is called La Vie Ideale. It's her ideal life with all of these animals. And she's a mother or queen or sister. or um, And uh, lots of different cat animals, as you can see. Uh, so <clears throat> I think there were many aspects to animals that she loved. And, and also, uh, like Leonor Carrington. I think Feeney and Leonor Carrington are the, the main ones really famous for their animal uh, identification. Uh, Leonor Carrington saw the horse figure almost like a psychic guide. Yes. Kind of guiding her into into the into another yes. world away from the, yes. the the world that she was in. Yeah, uh, I'm also so interested to see how often she's wearing the Leonor Finn is wearing masks. Masks have multifaceted meanings, but sometimes wearing a mask can, is is almost like armor. It's almost like protective, and some of her her costumes also almost seem Elizabethan in that kind of protective um, manner. Yes. Was there any biographical um, details of her life that might have meant that she would like to remove, take one step re removed from other people? Yeah, there are some very crucial uh, events in her young life as a child, which could make a good explanation for her need to dress up or for her wish to dress up and to mask herself and just put up a mask to make it more... <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> uh, she was, uh, her mother left her father when uh, Leonor Fini was a baby and they lived in Buenos Aires and uh, obviously the father was a tyrannical and maybe violent man who the mother left. She, she went back to Italy with her baby daughter and the father came after uh, and once tried to abduct his daughter in the streets of Trieste uh, with the help of some men. They kind of took her on the street and, and wanted to physically just remove her and abduct her. Someone intervened, so, so it never uh, came about. But she has a remembrance, she says it. She, she speaks about this physical memory she has of being taken by a superior man or by very frightening man on the street. And uh, after this episode, her mother started to dress up Leonor Fini as a boy sometimes to hide her from this father and his men. Um, it sounds a bit, it could be a bit exaggerated, like a bit of a, of a mythical story too. And she loved this story, she often told it so. But it would be an explanation, of course, for, for the power of dressing up as a kind of protection and also for all of these uh, images uh, of dominant women with androgynous men. She, she very expressively has spoken about how she does not like the macho uh, type of man, the, the very masculine type of man. She, she preferred androgynous bodies and men. So uh, there might be such an explanation. So and also, as I have been, I, I've learned so much about her in different ways. She was, she could be very afraid. Uh, there was next to this autonomy and power and self-evident place she was taking. There was a fear to the fear of not being seen and the fear of, of being alone and so on. So. At the end of her life also she became quite uh, depressed when her closest partners died and 
it was very hard for her to, to feel lonely. Yeah. Well, just, just one last question before we throw the questions out to the audience. But um, um, as, as Leonor Finney becomes better and better known, and hopefully through initiatives like your book, um, her costume designs um, for theatre and opera and film and also theatre designs um, will become better known. Um, in, in what ways do you think that her, her work is, is, it will, is influential today and will become more influential? Huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, it may keep empowering people uh, both of both sexes in a way, even though this is kind of what everybody does today in a way like being very obsessed with your self-image and it's, it's almost relatable to selfies and social media. But um, in her time, this was something very, very courageous. And it, it means uh, to really, I mean, take, taking your space as yourself and, and uh, being open to experimenting with yourself without uh, kind of always um, I think there is something philosophically interesting about her um, that, that still inspires people. The, the exhibition uh, of her works in 2018 in New York, there was a big retrospective at the Museum of Sex. It was the most success, successful exhibition of that museum ever. ever. There were so many visitors. And also in Venice uh, now, when I, I was at the exhibition Surrealism of Magic, there were, was a little room with her paintings. There were so many people standing there, fascinated. And it were not even these pictures. But um, So I, I don't know. It's, uh, there is a force there that is inspiring, the, the force to kind of uh, dare to break rules, there to, it's like it's a bit like actually Lady Gaga's effect has been on people. It's uh, not only about her music or her looks, but actually about the things she says. Actually, <laughs> uh, the, what does she say with all this? And I think these things are still very inspiring. So I, I'm not sure about the art as influential, but I think her personality is can be uh, very inspiring. I mean, I, th I think the wonderful thing is that, as you say, that so many of these women surrealists now are suddenly coming out of the woodwork. And um, I, was, I was thinking how incredible, because in 2002, um, the Pompidou had a, a large exhibition on surrealism, and there was only one woman artist in the exhibition, which was Merit Oppenheim. And this year, for the centenary of surrealism, 100 years since André Breton's manifesto, there will be another huge exhibition at the Pompidou and 40% of the women of the artists will be women. So that means in 22 years, it's gone from one woman artist to 40%. And so that's something to really be celebrated. And I'm sure Leonor Finney will have a very good showing at that, at that exhibition. So would anyone like to ask a question? Uh, okay, good evening. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, uh, very uh, interesting uh, presentation and uh, also the questions. I, I would like uh, to know uh, uh, if uh, during your uh, investigation in the archives, uh, did, did you find uh, uh, a diary? Did, did Leonor Fini uh, keep a diary because she wrote this book uh, the book of, of um, I don't re really remember the book of Leonor Fini, but uh, uh, okay, well, can you tell us more about what she uh, wrote, if she had a diary? Yeah, uh, that's very interesting. I have not found a diary. I think she, she very often writes about herself in the shape of letters. She wrote lots of letters. She wrote, for example, a letter to her mother every day, <laughs> uh, her mother in Italy. So I think the diaries are in the letters, and then also, in a way, the stories she writes, the novels, she wrote several novels and, and stories, of course, in these, they are also, in a way, autobiographical. 
So now I don't think she wrote the real diary. Uh, and Le Livre de Leonor Fini, it's, it's not kind of a biography actually, it's, it's more like a collection of her thoughts, her most uh, important paintings that she likes most, and of the photographs uh, depicting her that she likes the most, or that she identifies with. Is it, is it, can we buy it, or has it been, uh, is it possible to buy it in the bookshops, or yes, is it out of print? Yes, it is. Yes. And would you recommend reading it? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a very special book. It's like a self-portrait done in 1975 of the older uh, artist. And uh, personally, I prefer, in art terms, I prefer her earlier artwork. So I do not really like the artwork she has in that book. So in that sense, um, personally, I find it super interesting. And the texts are fantastic. Uh, because she was a very good writer as well. But back to your question, I don't think she wrote, uh, she didn't, uh, I don't think she, she wanted to write things that others read, I would claim, thinking about, I've never thought about that question interestingly, so uh, I think she wanted to write something that somebody else read and responded to. <laughs> yes. Who is in charge of who is in charge of, um, of the archives at Rue La Brière? It's Richard Overstreet. Who is he? Uh, <laughs> he's an American uh, artist, artist, art historian. He has also worked a lot with film, uh, with great um, directors, actually both American and French. He is 88 years old, so, uh, and at this very moment he is in San Francisco with his family, but uh, he lives in Paris um, normally, and uh, he is in charge, and he was, um, he met Leonor Fini when they both were working on a film by John Huston in 63, I think. And uh, she was the costume designer and he was the director's assistant. So he was helping her to find a cat, actually, <laughs> uh, when they were filming in, in a foreign country. However, um, they met and they became friends and lovers, I believe. It's not really, I've never really asked the question, but he lived with Leonor Fini and her two main partners during uh, about 20 years, I believe, or even more. And he was 30 years her junior or something like that. Thank you. Uh, and again, the archives have now mainly been moved to Yale University, Beinecke Library. But there is still quite a lot uh, at the Rue de la Vrière. Uh, so thank you for the talk and the conversation. Uh, I am really interested in the use of photography in these uh, performative acts. Yeah. Uh, and um, at least in the, from what I can hear from your talk, uh, the, the photographs that you've shown us from her, maybe, maybe she becomes a mature artist, is that the camera or the photography becomes an important space almost for these performative acts. Not only as documentations, but they are performative acts in themselves. But what I'm interested in is what you said in the beginning of your talk, uh, and which I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on, is the way you said that um, she becomes Leona Fini through the, the, the eye of the photographer. <laughs> and, and that is a bit in contrast to when she then becomes... I don't like the word mature, but <laughs> more kind of maybe established because there she seems to have a very strong agency and and a very strong idea of herself. So why would it be the photographer that kind of makes her become that? Could it be seen differently? What what is it that you base your claims on when you say that? That would be well. Okay. I, I I wrote a long part on this in the book and it's I, I just said it in one sentence but um, well first of all you, you remember the quote that she had she was extremely shy as a child she hated to be photographed 
you really hate it to be on a picture. So something must have happened. And when you follow your, her photographs, and I only showed a few of them, you can see how she she's very shy, she's awkward looking, she's not beautiful at all in these early pictures where she's 18, 19, 20 years old. And you can see how she gradually becomes more and more self-confident and kind of embraces her own looks and her face. There's a very interesting uh, comparison I've made between two passport photographs, uh, which I would have only a few years between them. In the one, she's like very shy and she has this very conventional hairstyle and she, she looks sad and her eyes are a little bit like silent, the movies, the stars of silent movies. <laughs> And then uh, in the next one, she's like a fierce, like a like cat. And it's, it's, it's like she finds her gaze, she finds her mimics, she finds her poses. And I believe uh, that these findings are based on working with very good photographers who also understood what she could be. So she very early on, I believe, took on her own agency in these photographs. Like uh, already with his early 30s photographs of Veno Pilon and, and uh, also something interesting that Richard Overstreet has told me and he has photographed her as well. He's also a good photographer and has photographed many of her cats for different books. And he says that there were some, there were a few of all of these photographers that really uh, had a perfect chemistry with her self-staging. Dora Maar, for example, uh, they both were, in a way, theatrically um, inclined, or also André Ostier, of course, who you see here, um, succeeded in, they, they kind of had a perfect collaboration where she could be who she wanted and the photographer could depict her in exactly the way she wanted to be seen. So, so that, that's all of this is, is what I mean. Uh, she becomes both on her own terms because she wants to become and she wants to try out things. And maybe she, she, co she of course, choreographs her pictures. Uh, on, on the other hand, you have the photographers sometimes also coming from fashion. Many of them were also active as fashion photographers. And in fashion photographers, you learn to depict people in the most... Uh, kind of seductive way, or in the most sensually attractive way. So I think this, this is all plays in. It, it, it comes together. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, she obviously thought that clothes had some kind of power on one's personality, and do you think she would, like, in that way, she would believe in animism or some kind of power, like superior power, or something like that. Um, she was obviously passing on the clothes after she used them, so maybe she was like hoping to. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I think she she was certainly open to such thoughts, mm. but she wasn't uh, uh, devoted to any kind of belief. <laughs> okay. She was, uh, she was open for such ideas, but she never became a kind of um, follower of any such idea. So, but, but of course, many of her practices kind of uh, suggest that she, she thinks she has made many masks, for example. And there are these, uh, there are these um, writers which were very important for surrealism, like Calois who wrote about the mask as something that is both uh, something that transforms and at the same time it's a theatrical performance. And that I think was very interesting to her that, that a mask can transform you, but it is at the same time it's a spectacle. So I think, um, yes, I, I think she, she felt, she, she writes about how she feels that putting on animal attributes make her invulnerable or aggressive or whatever. So she definitely was open for the, the force mm -hmm. in clothes, but not on this maybe spiritual level. Yeah. I don't think 
Do, do we know what she looked like every day when she was just going shopping or going to the park? Or are there any pictures of what she looked like when she wasn't dressing up? Yes, yes, there are lots. She was very stylish, but she wasn't like she didn't she didn't want to be a spectacle on the street. She was just very, very fashionable, mm -hmm. and she also created her own fashions. And uh, people ask her, do you, "Why don't you be? Why aren't you a fashion designer?" Uh, no, because I want to wear these things myself. I don't want to give them away to somebody else. So she did theatre costumes for stage performances, but not uh, fashion design for others. But she was extremely stylish and fashionable in, in all. And as soon, uh, even when she was at home uh, working in her art, in her studio, she was dressing up. Uh, yeah, not only for spectators. Do we have uh, access to audio recordings? And if so, what was her voice like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually wanted to show something from a film, uh, but I couldn't get access. Um, there have been made several documentaries about her, uh, and especially one of them is, is interesting by a director called Ivan Butler. Um, French director in the 60s called La Monde, Le Monde de Léonor Fini. And she speaks, uh, she had a very, she, she kind of lowered her voice <laughs> to make it more dramatic. And there are very funny stories of her trying to terrify people when, <laughs> when some new visitor would come to her home and she she wanted to scare them she especially male visitors she was like lowering her voice and dressing up in a very intimidating way and then she would meet them and afterwards she would like laugh with her friends and say haha did i scare him <laughs> and then like uh, breaking up so she was she was dramatizing her voice and she also had a special she was italian but speaking French, she had a kind of, she created a bit of a special version of French as well, which was kind of inspired by Italian. And she, she had rolling R's, for example. Uh, I can't uh, imitate something now. Uh, something like that. So she, she was very dark. <laughs> a male, a male voice. She wanted to, to imitate a male voice. Um, so yes, uh, but there are recordings and we... Uh, I, I will have to get back. I realized today that the link doesn't work anymore. So <laughs> I need to find them in the archives. Thank you. The last one. Um, I think she lives here with um, André Pierre de Mondial, yes, and uh, who is somebody, someone who, who is very baroque, original, and um, it's in interesting to to see she goes with people as uh, original as her, yes, because he was very very yes. eccentric. Uh, Yes. Raffiné. Well, she really uh, embraced creativity. I think she was really fascinated by creative people. And she also helped, actually, several male talents to, to kind of find their career as writers or as artists. And uh, looking out for that. Um, but also she liked the outlaws. She was very good friends with Jean Genet. For example, and, uh, and they really understood each other. So, so she looked for transgressive people. Uh, yes. 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 And uh, André Pierre de Mondial, uh, very importantly, wrote the text for her book on masks. It's it's a book with his text and lots of photographs by André Ostier showing her in masks, like this one, for example. And it's a very, it's a wonderful text on her masks and why she uses them and explaining actually this notion that she, um, it's, a, it's a game for her, he writes, 
she, he has this wonderful story where he says that um, when she feels down, she, she says, uh, I'm going to put myself in owl costume and then I can fly away. Yeah. Like she really used dressing up as a way of feeling better. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, that's a good lesson. That's <laughs> dressing up to feel better. So thank you very much, uh, Andrea Kolnitz and uh, Sasha D. Willem. So and uh, thank you all for coming. <coughs> Uh, if you have time, you can stay for a little glass afterwards. Uh, so, thank you very much.